There's a famous quote by Billy Bremner that says, every time Leeds concede a goal, I feel like I've been stabbed in the heart. Now you don't need to have stepped much further than your own front door to know what the man we're talking about. And you don't really need to be a football fan either. This is when you're nothing but a vessel and nothing in existence compares to the one thing that holds you hostage. I leave my hotel room at eight in the morning, have my key into reception. The thought of a fried breakfast makes my stomach turn, so I order a nice cold pint of lager instead. I sup it in silence, that fat fuck Eamon Holmes on the TV behind us, punctuating the awkwardness between me and the barmaid. She looks startled and uneasy, not wanting to leave the bar for fear of what I might do behind a watchful eye. But she needn't bother, I'm no danger to anyone besides my own sorry self. I step outside and light a cigarette, first, shield, first shielding the flame from a hint of a sea breeze and then shielding my eyes from the early morning sun. I walk up South Parade towards Fitzgerald's. I catch a flashing glance from the old boy who sits outside. He looks right at home there with his pint of ale and his morning paper, but his eyes look lost as if he's waiting for something and yet he knows it'll never happen. He's got a Newcastle United badge on his coat so he probably ain't too far wrong. I type out a text and delete it, stood opposite the York House Hotel. I try calling and don't get an answer, but that's probably just as well. She told me about him last night, but not of her own volition. And the thing that winds me up is that I didn't feel a hint of suspicion. On those nights we spent alone, we were the only two alive. In this sunless hole, this paradise, we've only loved to survive. I remember the first thing she told me, as we both gazed out to sea. They're all just nymphs and thugs. What the fuck does that make me? I climb aboard the free away and buy a single ticket. My head rests against the window which gently vibrates. Waves crash against the slim Northumbrian coast in the distance and seagulls float around gracefully in ravenous packs. She didn't tell me his name, she didn't have to. It don't bother me in the slightest. His very existence is my moistened Adam's apple. The saliva in my throat that's ready to retch at any given moment. I think of all those nights when she told me that she was crippled by her loneliness and that she felt suffocated and buried alive whenever she contemplated the future. When she told me how scared she was and how nobody would even notice if she necked a bottle of Bombay leaping from the pier never to be seen again. And all the while I believed her. Christ, I even cried for her. And all the while she's been texting me and then not answering the phone because he's fucking her in her mum's box bedroom and then texting me back once he's fallen asleep telling me that a phone had slipped under the cushion while she was watching TV or she'd left it upstairs and not realised or there were no signal in the pub when she was out of the girls. They're the words that she used to describe them. Every single man she's ever met. They're all just nymphs and thugs. You're the only decent one I've seen yet. Well, that was then, and this is now. No one know the truth. No one know about him, the other man, the man who holds her, keeps her stored away in this soulless shithole. And I'm on my way to win her back. I get off the bus station at Bridge Street. I cut along Union Street to get to Plessy Road. I walk, along, I walk alongside Croft Park where the Spartans play, past the clubhouse, and through the back alley leading to Cypress Gardens. I turn left onto Princess Louise Road and straight across the big green roundabout at Broadway Circle. They're all just nymphs and thugs. I walk past the broken cash machine, further down Princess Louise Road. I turn left onto New Newsome Road. This is where I start to feel sick. My heart begins to palpitate. I find it hard to breathe. I light another fag. A lengthy queue at the bus stop scowls and observes. Confused and concerned. Disgusted but reserved. Fearful maybe. But we needn't bother. I'm no danger to anyone besides my own sorry self. I reach for co-op on the corner of South End Avenue. Try calling her again. But no answer. I send her a text telling her to expect a knock on the door. My throat retches and as I double over I leave nothing but beer and bile in the bin. I turn left onto Words of Avenue. Words of Avenue become Shelley Crescent, follow the curve around the green, and then I'm stood on Byron Avenue. This is where she lays her head at night. This is where she cries and this is where she dreams. This is where he holds her close and where she's used me as a counselor and a therapist, always there at the end of the line just to make her feel a bit better about herself. And whilst I've been building as a future, this is where she dwelled on nothing but the past. She told me she was scared of the future, but I was going to make it better. It was outside that clubhouse when I thought I'd stolen her away, beside the lamppost and the bushes, safe from all the disarray. And I told her, it's never enough for me just to know you're nearby. But her shoulders were hunched. She couldn't look me in the eye. This was tension that she carried, not the usual mystique. And then her lips became a blade, and the beautiful was bleak. And that's when it hit me. That feeling that Billy talked about, that sickening sense of loss, that despair that just leaves you feeling redundant. And I was standing outside her house, all alone. I've never felt so alone in my life. And I can't help but thinking, maybe she's lying. Maybe she's scared that I'll fall short and she'll end up even worse than she was before. Maybe she's just shacked up for a fortnight with a local loser, hoping I'll leave her alone and it'll scare me off for good. Her curtains twitch, and then a cool, cold face emerges. Hers is a radiance that makes you forget yourself in an instant. 
She stands there like a porcelain statue. From here she looks breathtakingly beautiful, but up close she's riddled with cracks. A front door flies open and his frog marching towards They're all just nymphs and fogs and these girls are very wards I use every muscle in my body to stay here standing still One half is fucking petrified, one half's inclined to kill He measures me and sneers and it's almost like he's pouting She's still inside a bedroom, crying now and shouting The neighbours ponder my demise or ITV And then he breaks my nose like you might make a cup of tea And as he beats me, I fall towards the floor I kiss this bed of concrete, lie begging him for more This sends a wave of rage to his Neanderthalic brain but for his woman the way it's above this is a fraction of the pain he finally stops he spits and takes a breath he leaves me a defeated an inch away from death he walks inside and i just crawl towards the curb like a dying dog i'm graceful not wishing to disturb i wait for her to come down and help me lick my wounds but there's a nearest silence and that tells me everything i need to know maybe she does want to come down maybe she does want to come down and see me but she can't maybe he'd raise a fist to her as well i guess love's a pretty terrifying burden by christ they don't know how to fuck around with your brain it's time to take the bit between the teeth. That's what I told myself all along. Well, more fool me for going where I wasn't wanted. I hope she's rifled guilt, lying crippled on the floor. I hope she dies of shame after fighting a 50-year war. But as it drip blood in the gutter, it's too late to pretend that in this world of nymphs and thugs, I love her till the end. Cheers. Oh.